Hello everyone, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. So let's keep talking about the different peoples of the Roman Empire, and we're going to start in this video with Roman Egypt. Now, there's a reason I'm starting with Egypt, as opposed to the barbarian peoples of Northern Europe, or the Greeks, or anyone else the Romans came into contact with. Egypt, for the Romans, was a mysterious, almost fantastical land full of stereotypes, and often held up as the very opposite of what it meant to be Roman. So, during the last war of the Roman Republic, when Octavian was fighting Mark Antony for control of Rome, Antony allied with Cleopatra Philopater VII, the ruler of Egypt, and Octavian and the Roman Senate made a lot of propaganda out of this alliance. And, when Antony created the so-called Donation of Alexandria, distributing Roman territory to the children not only of Cleopatra, but to Caesarion, the son of Julius Caesar, by Cleopatra, this angered Octavian, and it was one of the leading causes of the war. So Antony was charged as being uh, overtaken by Oriental luxury. And how could you not think of Egypt as being a land of luxury and pleasure? I mean, look at it. Probably everyone has heard this in their Western Civ 101 classes, but what's the famous line about Egypt? Um, you know, coming from the Egyptians themselves. It's the land of the Red Land and the Black Land. So the Black Land is territory watered by the Nile, and the Red Land is the infertile desert. So the whole thing is a massive floodplain. And the Egyptians exist because of the Nile. And, you know, what a marvelous civilization that river gave birth to. Pyramids, sphinxes, um, elaborate tombs. And then, of course, we have the Egyptian concept of, um, well, I'm not actually going to pronounce it because I don't really know how it's pronounced, um, but it's this Egyptian concept of luxury and bliss and luxurious plenty that comes from living on the bank of the Nile. Now, this was, to the Romans, the oldest civilization they possibly knew about. And then, after this, of course, there's the political status of Egypt in the Roman Empire. So this was not an imperial province, this was not a senatorial province. Instead, Egypt was originally the personal property of the emperor, and because of that, Egypt eventually developed a remoteness uh, in the Roman psyche. It was part of the empire, yeah, but like not really. It was unique. And prior to the crisis of the third century, when Egypt becomes detached and becomes part of the Palmyrene Empire, the most striking thing about the references to Egypt in Roman sources is that alienness, is that privateness. Um, and at the same time, this was a region which, you know, if the Romans don't have it, arguably Aspects of the Roman Empire could not have existed. It was the granary, which, much like Ukraine, was the granary of the Russian Empire in the 19th century. You know, this fed Italy, this fed Rome. And when the Romans first start dealing with Egypt, it was already over a thousand years old as a civilization. But when the Romans first encounter it, it wasn't a sovereign state. It had been conquered and incorporated into numerous other empires, and it was ruled by a dynasty. The Ptolemies, named for um, Alexander the Great General Ptolemy Sardar I, and they ruled Egypt between 323 and 30 BC. Now, this was a dynasty which, I think if we can summarize the nature of an entire dynasty's 300-year reign, um, it would be to say that Ptolemaic Egypt was highly syncretic. They presented themselves as the legitimate pharaohs of Egypt, but they employed Greeks and Macedonians as their bureaucrats in general. So under the Ptolemies, their language, at least the language of the court anyway, was Greek. And under their rule, Greek colonies and Greek farms were established in Egypt, especially around the Fayum Lake. Incidentally, one of the earliest points of agriculture in Egypt, and they were granted legal rights and privileges not afforded to regular Egyptians. But... Just like in the Roman Empire proper, in Ptolemaic Egypt, the concept of Greekness, this wasn't necessarily a concrete concept. Now, certainly it was if you lived in Greece, but outside of it, um, this is where it starts getting a little bit murky. So there's something of a modern-day political issue going on between Greeks and Macedonians, I don't know how prevalent it is, um, over the issue of whether or not the ancient people we call Macedonians and their most famous leader, Alexander, should be considered Greek or not. This is actually something that ancient peoples fought over, too. And certainly we know that the Macedonian language was closely related to ancient Greek, but whether it was a regional dialect 
like a version of Greek or something distinctly related to Greek but separate at the same time, kind of how like Norwegian and you know Danish or both Germanic languages is not really clear as far as I'm aware, but I would be happy to be corrected on that. But as it stands, you go back to this period, um, and some ancient Greeks like the Athenian orator Demosthenes made fun of the Macedonians. He said they spoke Greek poorly, and though they attempted to be Greek, they would never fully be Greek. Other people said they were. It's a complex question, and we'll talk a little bit more about it when these videos get to Greece. But for our purposes here, for uh, Ptolemaic Egypt, the newcomers employed Greek as the lingua franca, so it really helped separate the rulers of Egypt from the ruled. Now Cleopatra, actually despite not being Egyptian, is the only ruler of this dynasty to actually have learned Egyptian to any degree of fluency. She actually spoke at least eight languages. Now in terms of overall population, which also, since we're talking about you know statistics and numbers, uh, include Jews here because of the Jewish population of Alexandria, utilized Greek, is maybe, maybe, uh, something like a million out of a total population of maybe four million by the last War of the Roman Republic who utilized Greek. So maybe a quarter of the population. And of course, what fascinated the Romans was the famous city of Alexandria. I mean, come on, even if you're talking to somebody who has absolutely no interest in ancient history whatsoever, I guarantee you that they have heard of the library. Maybe not the lighthouse, but definitely the library of Alexandria. This was a major cultural center, and with its lighthouse, both before and after it was destroyed by an earthquake, the city was a major port in the eastern Mediterranean, and it becomes the main port for shipping grain to Rome. Eventually, that city gained a reputation as a cultural center for Jewish and Christian philosophy, but we will cover that when we get to the Christians. So, the first treaty the Romans and the Ptolemies make is in 273 BC. Now, this was a general treaty of friendship, but it was also a military alliance instigated probably at the behest of the Roman Republic out of fear of another invasion of Pyrrhus, who had recently ravaged the Italian peninsula. So the negotiations for this treaty were conducted in Greek, and as far as diplomacy is concerned, things were actually pretty good between the two powers. There wasn't war between Egypt and Rome, um, and by the second century Rome is powerful enough that the other states in the ancient world start looking to Rome for military, political, and economic backing. Now, one of these states, eventually, is Egypt, which up to this point the Romans had treated like any other Hellenistic kingdom, except that now, in 55 BC, the Romans actually employ military force to back Ptolemy XII. Troops actually land in Egypt to help him out. Now, after losing the Battle of Pharsalus, Pompey retreats to Egypt, and he hopes to use the history of good Roman-Egyptian relations to get the Egyptian backing in his own power struggles, in Rome against Julius Caesar, but the Egyptians kill him instead. So when Caesar goes to Egypt in pursuit of Pompey, and he finds him dead, he's furious, but he spends the winter at Alexandria because he becomes infatuated with Cleopatra, and the two have a son as a result of this wintering. Well, Cleopatra becomes pregnant, at any rate, um, and this son is Caesarian. And when Caesar returns to Rome, he brings a model of the Egyptian solar calendar, which he uses to reform the Roman one. And eventually, in 44 BC, Cleopatra comes to Rome to visit him, and the Roman senators are furious because she was the embodiment of what they feared as, you know, Eastern decadence. But at the same time, much as the Soviet Union was fascinated in the 20s with Americana mania, Republican Rome was fascinated with Egyptomania. Now, if you leave Rome and you travel south, after about 23 miles, roughly, you will hit the city of Palestrina, for a nested to the Romans, and at one point in that city there was this gigantic apse uh, in a grotto, and this was covered by a massive mosaic, which still exists in, in pieces. It's called the Nile Mosaic, so it's part of a type of art called um, Nilotic Landscapes, which refer to anything and everything that depicts the Nile River. So when we look at this, we're taking a north-south view of the river, starting in Alexandria and working our way south. Now, the farther south you go, the more fantastical the art gets. We go from seeing soldiers in cities to seeing, um, you know, wild animals like leopards. Now, that's not too odd, but you also see sphinxes, pygmies, 
monsters. Now, like all primary sources, we have to ask who, what, where, when, and why. Well, we don't know the answer to all of these questions for this particular source, especially the why. We don't know why it was created, but what it represents, okay, we can definitely tell this, is the fascination with Egypt during the late Republic, because Nilotic landscapes are fairly prevalent in Roman art from this period. And, actually, the fascination shows up in writing, too. Diodorus Siculus, in his work The Library of History, talks a lot, and I mean a lot, about Egypt and Egypt's weird gods. They're half animal, half human, and the Romans actually embrace this. There are houses in Rome that were actually totally redecorated with wall paintings depicting Egyptian gods. And then, of course, we have the famous pyramid uh, of Cestius. So Cestius was a Roman senator, and it really speaks, I think, to the intense interest that the Roman elites held toward Egypt that he built himself a pyramid. I mean, if that doesn't mean a group of people are fascinated by another culture, I don't really know what does. Now, we don't know how far this intense interest in all things cultural went down the ranks, but what we can say is that there was an extreme interest in Egyptian religion and syncretic religions, which is where we will turn in the next video. So with that said, I'm going to close this one now. Thank you for watching, guys, and I'll see you all again in the next video.